If this is your first uh, talk that you've seen today, welcome. Um, this is the last presentation we've got for Novak's Astronomy Day. Uh, so um, I want to make a couple of comments. First, um, Alan mentioned this before, but I'd like to give credit to my uh, co-coordinator, who I don't see in the crowd at the moment. Um, Cambridge Giles gave me uh, quite a bit of assistance this year with this event. Um, and so made it a lot easier for me to, to make this uh, event today happen. Also, all the volunteers and all of our uh, presenters, I'd like to thank them specifically because there's no way that this event would function without a whole team. So give them a round of applause. Um, so as I've got a one order of business that uh, I've been asked to, to talk a little bit about. Um, Novak is uh, coordinating the Astronomical League's conference called ALCON this year. Um, it's going to take place, uh, it's the DC area, but it's really in Boston, since most of you in the crowd probably know where that is. Um, it is a, someone help me with the dates, 10th through the 13th of August? 13th. Thank you. Yeah, August 10th through the 13th um, this year. And uh, there's uh, presentations like the ones you're seeing today. Um, there are uh, tours of various uh, astronomy-related sites um, in the DC area uh, that you can do. Um, there's all sorts of people are coming from all over um, the, the region covered by the Astronomical League, which is, I think, everywhere, right? Um, so. Uh, registration is, is online. Um, if you Google for Alcon 2016, you should be able to find the site. Go and check it out. It's going to be a really great event. Um, we'll tweet the link from Novak's website too. Ah, okay. So if you go to Novak, Novak's website, uh, you can find a link to it straight from there. Um, this is one of our yearly events. We've got another one coming up. It is uh, the Almost Heaven Star Party. It takes place in, uh, at the Mountain Institute, which is near Spruce Knob, West Virginia, the highest point in West Virginia, and one of the darkest sites on the, near the East Coast. Um, it's a great event. It's over Labor Day weekend, uh, several days of camping and observing and other events that you can do. Um, fantastic. I've been there several years in a row, and I've never been disappointed, even when, even when the weather doesn't quite cooperate. That said, last year we had four beautiful nights. So. Um, as for what we're, what's going to happen after this, um, of course, we've got the sky tour and uh, the telescope tour going on. As you might imagine, the sky tour is a little tough with clouds, unless you like to you know, know your cloud types. How many of you can actually name those? Do we have any meteorologists in the crowd who can help us with that? Ah, tree. OK. So um, the, the, if we get some holes in the clouds, then we can show you things in the sky. Otherwise, you're welcome to take a look at the telescopes that we've got set up. Um, many of our members are participating in, in something we're trying for the first time called a telescope tour. Um, they're able to tell you all about how their scopes function and the types of things that, that you might look at through those scopes. Um, so feel free to, they're, they're all set up in, uh, along the vehicles over uh, just outside the fence here. Um, I think that about wraps up what, I'd, what I've got to say. So uh, we'll get to um, our final presentation. We've got Danny Glavin, who's going to present on meteorites, as he's called them, frozen time capsules from the early solar system. Uh, Dr. Glavin is an astrobiologist and the associate director for strategic science at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. His research in the astrobiology analytical laboratory at NASA focuses on searching for the organic building blocks of life in extraterrestrial materials, including meteorites, asteroids, and comets, and on Mars. Dr. Glavin earned a, P, uh, sorry, a BS in physics from the University of California at San Diego and a PhD in earth sciences from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Danny first became interested in meteorites and astrobiology research after the 1996 announcement that the Martian meteorite um, Allen Hills 84001 contained evidence of ancient Martian life. Dr. Glavin was a member of the 2002-2003 Antarctic search team, uh, search for meteorites team, um, ANSMET, right, uh, that collected over 900 meteorites in Antarctica over a period of six weeks. So he's going to talk a bit about that in this presentation and more. Um, yeah. Dr. Glavin. Great. Thank you, Zach.
Okay, so I hope to keep you entertained for the next 30 or 40 minutes, um, talking about uh, my passion, which is uh, meteorites, explain to you why I think they're important scientifically, what we can learn about not only the origin of our own solar system, but potentially the origin of life from studying these samples. Um, as Zach mentioned, I will talk about uh, the six-week expedition that I participated in in 2002, where a team of scientists, including myself, went to Antarctica to search for meteorites, similar to the one you're looking at there, um, uh, to collect them for scientific analysis. And then I'll wrap up and I'll talk about NASA's first asteroid sample return mission called OSIRIS-REx, um, which is scheduled to launch uh, this September 2016. So I encourage you all to go down to Florida. I know I'm going to take my kids and probably do some Disney World trips as well, but it should, should be quite fun. Next slide. Okay, so why are meteorites important? Um, they can actually tell us about uh, the evolution of uh, stars. Um, I'm, I'm, when I first got involved in meteorites, I was surprised to find out that some of these meteorites actually contain dust grains um, from other star explor explosions nearby supernova. So these supernova events basically carried these dust grains, silicon carbide grains, or even nanodiamond type grains, uh, into our solar system, and we're we were swept up, and uh, these meteorites contain that evidence. So really pre-solar system material, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, we can learn about the age and evolution of our own solar system, which is about, uh, these meteorites are about 4.56 billion years old, uh, many of them older than the age of the Earth itself. Uh, by measuring the amounts of the various elements inside the meteorites, we can estimate uh, these ages and determine what the chemical composition was of the early solar system. Um, we can learn about the, the history, the geological history of the Earth and the Moon. Um, as you probably are aware, the Earth is basically, the history of the Earth is basically a series of uh, Im big impact events, including the one here that actually formed the Moon. Mars-sized object hit the Earth and uh, created the Moon a long time ago, but we've been continuously bombarded with these big impacts, uh, leading to, uh, in some cases, mass extinctions, including the 165 million years ago, which led to the demise of the, the dinosaurs. And then, uh, this is where I, my research is focused on, is really looking at the origin and history of life on Earth. Some of these myriads actually contain the organic chemical building blocks of life, amino acids and uh, nucleobases, the genetic code in our DNA and RNA. One theory about the origin of life is that meteorites could have seeded uh, not only the early Earth, but other planets in our sol solar system with the raw ingredients for life. Um, and these samples are really important because the earliest, the oldest rocks on the Earth have, have been destroyed by plate tectonics and erosion. And so we've lost that early life chemical uh, evidence on Earth. So meteorites are the way we learn about that. Where do they come from? Um, most meteorites originate in the asteroid belt here. Uh, between Mars and, and Jupiter. Um, some of them get sent on trajectories, Earth-crossing orbits. Those are called the near-Earth objects. Those are the ones, of course, we're really interested in tracking um, as a hazard, impact hazard to the Earth. Um, but there are a lot of these uh, things. So there's uh, more than a million asteroids with diameters greater than one kilometer. And of course, these are the ones we're really interested in that because these are the ones that can do uh, potentially major damage uh, to the Earth and millions of more uh, asteroids that are, that are smaller than that in the main belt. Um, we also get meteorites from uh, Mars, which I'll talk about later, and our own moon as well. And we probably have meteorites in our collection that are from Mercury. So these are rocks that get ejected from these bodies and sent on uh, Earth-crossing orbits. Um, but we don't really know how to identify the, the Mercury meteorites very well. Next slide. Okay, so these materials really are um, they come from asteroids and comets, and they really are a window to our past. As I said, these are the frozen time capsules uh, from the earliest uh, part of the solar system. Um, and the Earth, in the early days, 3.8 billion years ago, there was a period of, they call it the heavy bombardment period, where um, lots of this material was impacting the Earth. So this wouldn't have been a very fun place to be at <laughs> if you were here 3.8 billion years ago. Um, and as I said earlier, the record of the origin of the Earth and potentially even the origin of life on Earth uh, has been destroyed by uh, erosion and plate tectonics, which, you know, these plates move and they get subducted and melted. So the, the earliest rocks on Earth where we think life may have started have been destroyed. So we really need to look to meteorites to learn about uh, the chemistry that potentially led to life. 
Next slide. Okay, so um, fortunately, we're not constantly being hit by the, the big guys. Um, in fact, most of the, the 40,000 tons of meteoric material that falls on Earth each year is in the form of these tiny uh, interplanetary dust particle grains. Okay, so these are really micron, tens of micron sized uh, particles that are collected in the, the Earth's stratosphere um, by high altitude aircraft and they bring them down and, and we can analyze them. And so um, this is kind of an interesting chart here which shows you know, the average time between impacts with the Earth and the size of the objects. So um, like I was saying here, you know, these millimeter to micron sized dust grains, you know, these things that we call them shooting stars, we know they're not shooting stars, they're actually these grains that heat up and, and give off light, um, you know, happen, you know, every, you know, few seconds here. Um, we get a meter sized body hitting every year. Uh, some of you probably remember back in February 2013, the Chelyabinsk um, event. That was actually pretty frightening. Um, I'm glad I wasn't there. Um, but this was the energy this thing gave off. It was a 60-foot uh, diameter uh, bolide. Uh, the energy given off was the equivalent of like almost 25 Hiroshima kind of uh, nuclear explosions. So a huge amount of kinetic energy. Um, did a lot of damage. Um, tens of kilometer kind of diameter uh, strewn field, the shock wave blew out windows. I think 1,500 people or around there were injured, mostly by flying glass and that kind of thing. But even some people reported, you know, kind of staring at the light and actually injuring their eyes from the, from the intense light in this thing. Um, so fortunately, these things don't happen often. <laughs> you know, uh, you get a, a Chelyabinsk every, once every 60 years. And again, you know, the big catastrophic events, you know, the dinosaur killers and that kind of thing are, we're talking, you know, 100 million years kind of time scale, so um, probably don't have to worry about that tonight. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, uh, could happen, but I don't, I don't want to scare anybody, all right? <laughs> okay, next slide. Okay, uh, just briefly want to go over the different types of meteorites. They're actually, all meteorites can be broken down into these uh, sort of three groups, big classes here. Uh, the stony meteorites, which was like the Chelyabinsk, 94%. Uh, the falls are, are those. The iron meteorites, these are the real heavy ones, mostly iron nickel. I don't know if you ever held one, but you kind of do this kind of thing with a softball size. They're really dense, only about 5% of falls. And then these mixes of st uh, stony irons. And these meteorites are basically put into these uh, subgroups based on their, the mineral makeup, the chemistry, and their isotopic compositions. And I think on some scales, there are like 45 different groups, subgroups of meteorites. So I'm not going to get into all of them, but it's actually quite complicated. And I'll take you through here. So the chondrites, um, most common type of meteorite that you'll find, you know, chances are if you find a meteorite, it's going to be a, a chondrite of some sort. And these contain the chondrules. These are these real round, uh, solid uh, blebs here of material, calcium aluminum rich inclusions. These are the first solid materials that formed in the solar system. So you, you can identify these chondrites by these sort of roundish blebs. Next step. Uh, the achondrites are exactly that. They, they don't have these chondrules. Um, these actually come from uh, larger differentiated bodies. So uh, if you go to the next step, um, you know, uh, meteorites from Mars and the Moon are achondrites. Um, and even the asteroid Vesta is kind of a mini planet, if you will, differentiated, you know, core, mantle, and that kind of thing. Uh, the, this would also fall into an achondrite group. If you go to the next step, focusing on the most common types here, chondrites themselves can be broken down into different subgroups here. Uh, the ordinary chondrites, uh, again, this was the Chelyabinsk uh, fall, again, most common uh, type of meteorite. The ones I'm interested in from an origin of life perspective are these carbonaceous meteorites because they're the ones that have a lot of organic carbon, the organic rich ones. Um, they're also very rare, so they're hard to find, which is while we go down to Antarctica and try to recover thousands of meteorites so we can get a few of those. If you go to the next slide. And then these carbonaceous chondrites can even be broken down. Sorry, this didn't come out very well, but into eight uh, groups here. Um, basically, uh, the ones on the left, these CIs, CMs, are ones that have been um, uh, aqueously altered, so exposed to water on the asteroid itself. And then these other ones, these high temperature ones, CVs, CKs, have been heated, kind of cooked on their asteroid. Um, and from an organic analysis perspective, we like these over here because they haven't been heated to high temperatures and so the organics are, are there. They, they haven't been destroyed by heating. So we tend to look at these guys. Okay, next slide. So I'll get, just to give you an example 
of one of those guys. Uh, this is a CM, carbonaceous chondrite. It's called Murchison, probably the most famous uh, CM type carbonaceous meteorite, certainly the most uh, well studied. It fell in 1969 in Australia, uh, about 100, so 222 pounds, uh, 220 pounds of this meteorite um, available uh, for analysis, and it, it definitely has been, uh, quite a bit of it's been used for scientific analysis. Most of this was actually stored here in Washington, D.C. at the Natural History Museum. They've got it in a, a wooden drawer, so uh, we'll request samples from time to time. Uh, one of the most amazing things about this rock uh, to me is that um, over 70 amino acids have been um, identified that are extraterrestrial in origin. And just to kind of emphasize that complexity, there are only 20 amino acids in life. And so there are many more in this meteorite. And so, you know, one of the questions I have is why those 20 for life? I mean, if Murchison-like samples were delivering, um, you know, hundreds, potentially hundreds of amino acids, um, why the 20? Why are those so unique? But, um, and then this is really cool. This is a cool result that came out a few years ago. We were actually able to prove that uh, some of the genetic components of DNA, so not DNA itself, but the nucleobases, the A, C, G, T, that you learn about in your biology class, uh, we found those in Murchison, and, and they were not terrestrial contaminants. These really were uh, uh, produced in the asteroid um, that delivered Murchison to the Earth. So pretty cool. And next step. So, of course, this begs the question, you know, if these building blocks of life are being created inside these asteroids, could asteroids and comets seeded the Earth or potentially even Mars with the chemical ingredients for life. Next step. Okay, so this, um, I think um, we heard from Zach, this is actually what got me into, uh, my, uh, you know, kind of sparked my interest in meteorites and astrobiology in general. And this was a, a huge announcement in 1996 where uh, NASA claimed that they had evidence of Martian life in this Martian meteorite. Even Bill Clinton, I think, at the time made an announcement that maybe we're not alone. It was, it was a big deal. Um, this meteorite's interesting because it is uh, the oldest Martian meteorite we have in our collection, four billion years. So, um, you know, if you look at Mars today, it's a very cold, dry kind of wasteland, not really a place, you know, an abundant abode for life. But four billion years ago, it was likely much different. Probably had oceans, uh, thicker atmosphere, conditions that are much more conducive for life. So the fact that this rock was on Mars during that time is actually really important. Um, it was on Mars during a time when it, Mars could have supported life. It was, it was ejected by an impact um, from another uh, asteroid uh, 15 million years ago, sent through space, where it eventually fell to Earth in, in Antarctica here uh, in the Allen Hills re region uh, 13,000 years ago. It uh, was discovered by a team of Antarctic Search for Meteorite or ANS Meteorite Hunters in 1984, and it was originally completely misclassified. It was classified as, a, uh, I believe, a, a Eucrite, a Vesta-type meteorite. Um, and then they realized that it was actually Martian in, in 1993. And then again, three years later, we, we, um, uh, NASA reported the evidence for life. You go to the next step. There were basically three lines of evidence here. Um, these worm-like structures, uh, they're really nano uh, fossils that they claimed were fossils. Um, the argument against that is at the time they said these structures were just too small for any known Earth-like bacteria, and they probably were not worms. If you go to the next step, uh, these magnetic chains um, were found on Earth. Uh, magnetotactic bacteria form these uh, mineral grains called magnetites, and they align themselves with the magnetic field on Earth in a, in a, in a particular orientation. And you kind of see that going on here, and so they said, wow, that's, that's interesting. You know, that's... You know, on Earth, you only find these chains when they're related to biology, so maybe there's something going on. I, I still think this is probably the best line of evidence that, uh, of all the three. Um, but again, you know, this, th this debate's been going on now uh, since 96, hasn't been resolved. And then finally, the last piece of evidence were these organic compounds. You can't really uh, see the structure, but these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are rings. Uh, kind of looks like a bee's honeycomb. Uh, these six uh, rings fused together. Um, the problem with the pause is, yes, they can be from life, but, uh, you know, they're everywhere. You, you look at them in interstellar dust, they're all over the place. You know, they're in your car exhaust. If you burn your hamburger on Fourth of July, it's, it's, it's that black crust. Um, not necessarily, a, 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 you know, a smoking gun for life. So, anyway, very intriguing, though. It still, in my mind, remains the, the most important find ever from Antarctica uh, related to meteorites because of this. Next slide. 
Okay, so why Antarctica? Well, of course, we, you know, we certainly want to find the next Martian meteorite and uh, look for evidence of life, but um, there are actually some uh, really good reasons to go to Antarctica. Um, Antarctica, it's kind of hard to see here, it shows up better on the computer, but the South Pole, it's actually at the highest elevation, and the ice you know, flows downward uh, towards the coastline. And as these meteorites fall, they basically get trapped in the ice, they flow towards the coast, and then they hit these trans-Antarctic mountains here. And the ice pushes up against those. The ice pushes up, so it's like a giant, uh, think of it like a giant conveyor belt, okay? Basically bringing these meteorites, concentrating them into these blue ice fields where they can be easily spotted. So, you know, it doesn't, anybody can be a meteorite hunter in Antarctica. It's really not that hard. You see a black rock on blue or white ice, and, you know, chances are it's, it's from space. Um, one of the important things, and you know, one of the things with the Allen Hills meteorite is um, we argued that those, those organics were actually contaminants uh, from the Antarctic ice itself. So um, you know, even though Antarctica is one of the most pristine environments on Earth, meteorites can still get contaminated there. I'll talk about that um, at the end. But nevertheless, if you're going to have rocks land, Antarctica is the best place. It's clean. You can see them easily, and they, and they get concentrated by natural processes. Okay. Okay, so uh, the Antarctic Meteorite Program, ANSMET, was established in 1976 uh, uh, by Bill Cassidy of the University of Pittsburgh. That's him here. He actually wrote a book called Meteorites, Ice, and Antarctica, and you can even see his snotsicles down there, you know. It's, uh, uh, it's quite an quite a impressive picture. It's really cold down there. It's, it's, it's crazy. And in your snot, it just freezes, you know, and um, it's just how it is. But... Um, so it's funded by NASA, the National Science Foundation, and the Smithsonian, the partnership. It's been going strong ever since. Uh, so uh, ANSMET sends teams of explorers, usually 8 to 12 people, uh, and you basically live on the ice. You live in these remote areas on the blue ice for six weeks in a tent, and you search for meteorites on snowmobiles and by foot. They get collected, um, and then eventually return to the NASA Johnson Space Center, and the Smithsonian, where they're classified and then made available to scientists throughout the world. Um, so these aren't, you know, just, even though it's a U.S. run program, we make these samples available to, to any scientist. Okay, next slide. And this is just kind of an interesting uh, chart here showing the number of meteorites brought back from, and, our, and again, this is just ANSMET. Japanese also have a, a, a really good program as well. But you kind of see it fluctuating here, and we're, we're getting better with time, you know, we're kind of finding the best locations now, but you'll notice it's still kind of jagged. There's some good years and bad years. Good years, and it seems to kind of alternate. And these really bad years are simply the weather was horrible those years. You were just stuck in your tent. If you're stuck in your tent because of a blizzard, you're not out hunting for meteorites. And then these good years are days where you had a lot of good tent days. And this was our year, um, 2002. We recovered over 900 meteorites, and at the time that was pretty close to, you know, doing pretty well, but now, of course, we were we were outdone by the following guys the next year, 1,358. And I think this is still the record. What's the, what's the mass size of these? They range. I mean, I'll show some pictures. You get something the size of a pea, you can barely see with your eye, to, you know, something like this. Most of them are kind of, you know, I don't know, golf ball size. Okay, next slide. And this is our team here uh, in the background. You can see Mount Erebus, which is one of the more, it's an actually an active volcano. I don't, know if, I don't know if you know that, but there's an active volcano there. Um, and we're taking a picture in front of it. Here's me. This is my tent tent mate, Dante Loretto. Turns out he is the principal investigator of the OSIRIS-REx asteroid mission. We didn't know that at the time, but he is now. And then point out uh, Katie Coleman, who's an astronaut. Uh, NASA actually likes to send astronauts down to Antarctica because it's so isolated. So you kind of get that even, it's not, you know, like space, but it's as close as you can get to kind of working in space on Earth. And then John Scott, who's really a legend, he's been there from the very beginning, is, you know, one of the most knowledgeable mountaineers. Uh, if you go down to Antarctica, you want to be with John. <laughs> he'll keep you safe. He'll keep you out of crevasses and that kind of thing. Next slide. And this is how we got down there. We took a flight uh, in a C-130, which is a giant military uh, aircraft, seven-hour flight to McMurdo where our 12-member team after training split up. So I was part of this eight-person team that went to Beardmore. 
uh, to look at some ice fields in the Trans-Antarctic mount Mountains. Uh, we were going to back to ice fields that had been previously uh, visited by a recon team, so they were known to contain meteorites. And then the other four-person team went to the South Pole to look at some sites that had never been visited by humans before, kind of scouting out for potential uh, sites for the future. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, so this was quite an experience. Uh, we actually we went with the New Zealanders and their uh, C-130 on the way down. But this is not your... Uh, so I have a new, uh, new perspective. I was used to really complain about economy seating on United and that kind of thing. <laughs> this is terrible. I mean, you, you're packed in here for seven hours, knee to knee, alternating. Uh, you can't really climb over each other very well unless you have to go to the bathroom, which is in the back, and it, which consists of really a bucket with a curtain that kind of doesn't really cover you all the way. Um, uh, I was told by Dean Epler, who um, uh, did some paratrooping, he said the reason that the Air Force uses this, these, these uh, aircraft for para, you know, training is because you'd rather jump out of one than stay in one. And I <laughs> can tell you that is just absolutely the truth. Uh, next, next slide. Um, this is McMurdo. Uh, I just uh, these pictures are really cool. This was um, it's it's just a strange mixer of uh, a college campus, a mining town, a military base, and a, and a research facility. It's kind of all kind of wrapped in one. There's about a thousand people, scientists and support staff um, from around the world who make McMurdo work um, in the summer. Um, and uh, you go down in the Antarctic summer, which is our winter here in the, in the northern hemisphere. Um, it's, just, it's just a wild, wild place. Um, but this is where we spent a week training and getting ready. You can't just go to Antarctica and go straight out in the field. You've got to train and do survival training. I'll show you a couple pictures about that that are kind of crazy. Um, so we learned how to set up our tents. Um, one of the biggest dangers down there, it's no secret, are crevasses. Some of these crevasses can get to be really big, 30 foot wide, a couple hundred feet deep, and they form these snow bridges on top, you know, from blowing snow that kind of meet. And they're not very thick, you know, a few inches maybe, a couple feet, and they can break open, and, and people have died um, on snowmobiles and walking around uh, in these. So we do training to, you know, pulley systems to learn how to rescue people. This was uh, one of the guys on our team who volunteered to actually get lowered into one of these. I don't know how he trusted us. Uh, uh, we actually took us about 30 minutes to get him out because the rope kept binding uh, on the snow, kept getting stuck. It was anyway, but, you know, it's important. You've got you to gotta go through these things. And we just prayed none of this. We'd, ever, we'd never need this training ever. Um, unfortunately, we, di we didn't. So next slide. Um, so from McMurdo, we took another C-130 flight. Uh, th these are actually called LC-130s because they have these um, uh, skis, basically. So these things can take off and land in the snow in the deep field. Um, and so we boarded and then headed out for a couple hour flight. Next slide. Uh, arrived at Beardmore. Uh, this is what they call the combat drop. You know, these are basically a bunch of military guys yelling at you, you know, get out, go, go, go. They don't want to turn off the... Uh, the propellers, they don't want to turn off the engines because it's so cold and they don't have a power supply to restart the engine out there. So uh, basically, yeah, it's just, it's quick. They, they roll all your, your gear off and yelling at you. Think it's very confusing. You know, you got fuel and stuff and exhaust and I don't know. It was, it was exciting and, and kind of nerve wracking at the same time. So we, yeah, we were left out there in the middle of nowhere. I think we determined that there were, it was a 300 mile radius of just nobody but us. Uh, so that's uh, the area is like, it's like the being the only person in the state of California is kind of thing. Uh, anyway, next slide. Um, and then where they landed is not, you can see there's a lot of snow here at Beardmore. That's not a good place to find meteorites. You actually want places where there's very little snow um, because they get buried and you can't see them. It does no good. So we actually had to traverse uh, 40 to 50 miles to get, get to these blue ice fields. And... Um, you know, it, it takes a while <laughs> on these things. You're going pretty slow, 10, 20 miles an hour. Of course, you're worried about crevasses, and so you, you're, you're taking your time. Um, but uh, we did it, pulled all our gear. It's a pretty day, so next, next slide. And this was what life was like for six weeks, and these, uh, they call them the Scott tents uh, after um, Scott, who, you know, made the uh, unfortunately failed attempt to be the first person to the South Pole, but... Um, and actually died on his uh, way back, but um, developed. This is the same technology that was used, you know, 100 years ago. Um, and we have ovens to keep us warm so we can get these tents, you know, 
toasty, 40, 50 degrees, something like that. But, you know, outside, it's, uh, where we were, it was, you know, around zero degrees Fahrenheit usually. So it's uh, pretty cold camping. I, I'd never camp from California, so that, that, was, that was crazy. Um, but you're, you're comfortable in your sleeping bags, and we sleep two to a tent, and, and that, uh, yeah, that was home. Next. And I mentioned the work tent days. Um, this would be a work day. Um, you think, oh, these look pretty similar, but look at the mountains in the back. So there are some severe catabatic winds, um, you know, 50, 60 mile an hour gusts. And we actually calculated that the wind chill was minus 60 Fahrenheit that day. So, you know, exposed skin in like 10 minutes will become frostbitten in that. So definitely not going out uh, on that day. So um, we got a little stir crazy. It was actually three days in a row. We were trapped in our tent. And so that was... That was kind of crazy, but What's um, um 8,000 feet here. So, um, but it actually feels the altitude down there. I don't know if it's the the pressure density or something, but it actually feels worse than the actual altitude. I don't know. I can't explain it, but um, you know, you, for people who get altitude sickness, uh, it's it's worse down there. I think because of the cold, the pressure density. But next slide. Okay, and here's what we did. Yeah, we just basically drove. Uh, we spread apart, I don't know, 30, maybe 40, 50 feet, and just kind of comb the ice back and forth, systematic search. And, um, you know, you'd find a meteorite, and you'd do your meteorite dance, you know, get all excited and wave, and then everybody would come over, and you'd bag it. Um, this is just kind of a neat chart. So these black lines are the, the snowmobile GPS uh, track, and then all these red dots are all the meteorites that we found. You can see... They're all kind of associated with these blue, you know, uh, aqua blue areas. Those are the exposed blue ice areas. Um, sometimes you find a weird one, you know, just in the middle of note. You don't know how it got there. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, next slide. Um, we also do some searching in the moraines. And the, again, the moraines are the, so there's basically glaciers down there, and they, they carry terrestrial rocks, right? They get carved up and mixed in here. This, this was a pain. I, I, I hated doing this, but on days where it was a little windy, you didn't want to go out to the blue ice field where you don't have protection, you would go to these moraines because they tended to be a little warmer. You could find meteorites, but most of the time you found what we say, call meteor wrongs. Okay, these are terrestrial rocks that, man, you, you we would argue about these things, and that is a meteorite. It looked so much like a meteorite, but it wasn't. And uh, um, we, we brought it, we did bring a metal detector, which made life a little easier. Um, but, uh, those metal detectors only detect the metal rich meteorites. So they're very biased, but we found some that were a foot under the ice that you never would have found without the, the, uh, the metal detectors. That was kind of fun. Next slide. Okay. So once we, we find the meteorite, uh, we measure its, uh, dimension. So this is centimeters. So again, most of them are sort of this size. Um, it's rare that you get one that big. That, that, that's, that's a pretty exciting day when you find one that big. Uh, most of them are this size. Um, this black stuff is the fusion crust. That's the stuff that got melted during the atmospheric entry. So that's an easy way to identify these things if you see the fusion crust. But you see a lot of it got knocked off and eroded. Uh, sometimes these rocks, have, all the fusion crust is gone. So that's uh, kind of difficult to tell it apart from a terrestrial rock. Um, and then some of them you can barely see. You can't even see that one, but it's just, it's about the size of a pea, real tiny thing. Um, we had a nickname for that, but I, uh, I won't mention it. It's uh, <laughs> kind of vulgar, but we didn't like those. Those were just a pain. A lot of, you know, collecting and bagging takes time, and we, we like the bigger ones. So next. Okay, so most of what comes back are these ordinary chondrites. Again, like the Chelyabinsk. I think that was an L, L5, the Chelyabinsk meteorite. Um, this was one of the ones we found in, in uh, MacAlpine Hills. Uh, really pretty when you look at these things in thin section under the microscope, especially in cross-polarized light. But, um, you know, they basically identify these things and classify them based on the mineral, minerals that they find in them and the assemblages. And next slide. And then some ty types are uh, much less common. So these are the, uh, in this case, an achondrite, a diagenite. So again, really pretty looking under cross-polarized light. Those are aren't the natural colors, but um, that's what it looks like under a cross. You, you can really see the crystals. And this is from asteroid Vesta, which is kind of neat. Um, and then here, LAP, this is from the La Paz. Um, the, the, the recce team near the South Pole came back with this CV3 carbonaceous chondrite. And again, these were the ones that I got really excited about. 
um, because they're the ones that typically have a lot of organics um, in them. And then, if we get really lucky, next slide, we hit the jackpot. And of course, this was the Martian meteorite Allen Hills, which I talked about earlier um, with the evidence, uh, potential evidence of Martian life. And then we also find rocks from the moon. And I get a lot of, you know, why do you care about meteorites from the moon? The astronauts went to the moon, brought back hundreds of kilograms of rocks, but they all went to the, the near side of the moon. They didn't sample anything from the far side for obvious reasons, want to be able to communicate and that kind of thing. But um, um, these meteorites get ejected from all over the moon, so we get samples from both the near and the far side, so a more representative set. And these are very rare, so only one in uh, every thousand meteorites come from, the Mars, come from Mars or the moon. So you don't find them often. We didn't end up finding one our year. We found 900. And maybe if we found 1,000, we would <laughs> the statistics would have did, but we, did, we didn't find one. Next slide. OK, and it's not all work down there, although we did work really hard, but we played hard. And it, I think it's important, you know, everybody's away from their families. Uh, it's pretty tough down there, uh, six weeks, because you miss all the holidays. You miss Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, you know, if you celebrate Christmas, and New Year's. Um, all three of those, you're away from family. And, but we kind of formed our own family, made a little snow, snow tree here and decorated it. Uh, we had eggnog and chocolates for Christmas, so we did our best. They sang carols at um, the, uh, the priests at, um, in the chapel at um, McMurdo, sang carols over the radio, so we were able to listen to Christmas carols. Okay, next slide. And then some more fun. This was really cool, big half pipe. We kind of slid down. Um, it's, it's weird down there because, you know, you want to have fun and play, but at the same time, you're thinking in the back of your head, you know, if I twist my ankle or break something, I'm in deep doo-doo. So you're, you know, you're kind of taking risks, but not really. So it's, there, there's a lot going on down there, um, a lot of things you're thinking about. But we would play three flies up and just kind of take it easy on days that we couldn't work. Next slide. And then uh, everything, all good things come to an end. So here we're packing up the meteorites. Um, they actually stay in a freezer at McMurdo, and then they get put on a ship in a freezer and sent to California and then trucked to Houston in a freezer truck where they're opened in, in Houston at NASA Johnson Space Center. Um, this is Ivan the Terabus. This thing is just a monster. So I'm five foot six. Th those are huge wheels. And um, this is what takes you from McMurdo out to the runways to the... This is our waiting room here <laughs> for the C C-141. So actually, you know, we were, we were happy. We, we knew we were getting home, so uh, it didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> so they actually, they have a little security thing in New Zealand, but no out here, you know. Yeah. And yeah, so all run by the Air Force. This was really cool. It was a C-141. So we came out on a C-130 with the, the props, and they're just slow. These are jets, so we got back in five hours, so that, that, was, that was, it was still cramped, but at least you're only suffering for five hours, not seven. Next slide. Okay, and I just talked about this, so get delivered by ship and, you know, to uh, Houston, and then the Smithsonian here does most of the classification here at the Natural History Museum. Um, I'm not sure if you knew that, but um, they get classified, they get published in the, in the meteorite newsletter, um, and then if you go to the next step, uh, scientists from around the world collect samples. So over 22,000 meteorites have been returned. 24,000 samples, so fragments, because people are requesting the same meteorite, have actually been sent out to 674 scientists in 30 different countries. This really is a, an international uh, effort. It's really exciting. Next slide. Okay, so uh, we can learn a lot from meteorites, but we can't learn everything, okay? We don't always know where they come from. In the case of Mars and the Moon, we do, and, and maybe Vesta, but, you know, in, in many other cases, we have no idea which asteroid is the parent body for these things. And then, as I mentioned, they're exposed to the Earth's environment. You can't get away from that. Once they fall and hit the ground, they're immediately becoming contaminated with bacteria from Earth and organics and things that make the science uh, complicated. So sample return missions are really important. Um, and uh, we're doing that. NASA and other countries are interested in going to these objects and bringing back sample from the service, pristine samples that we can protect from the Earth environment and actually keep that way. And we know where they came from. That's, that's another important thing. Next slide. Okay, so Cyrus Rex, I'm actually uh, one of the co-investor, co science co-investigators on this mission. Um, it's, as I mentioned, it's going to launch in September 2016. 
um, from Florida, September 8th, I think, is the first day possibility. It's going to go uh, 2019, uh, go to asteroid Bennu, grab a piece of sample, hopefully 60 grams or more, uh, and then bring it back to Earth seven years later in 2023. Um, actually, this, this asteroid, is, it was originally called 1999 RQ-36, which is kind of boring. Um, and it was a th third grader, I believe, from North Carolina who named it Bennu, uh, which is from the Egyptian uh, uh, god. Uh, it's a bird, basically. And he thought that with these kind of wings out and, you know, this being the claws, it kind of looked like uh, Bennu. So that's Bennu. <laughs> Next slide. And uh, here's basically what we know about Bennu from the shape. This is radar data, which reminds me, I think there's a fellow named Chip over here who's going to be looking for some near-Earth objects using... Oh, there he is in the back. So if you're interested in looking for uh, potentially Earth killers, <laughs> go talk to Chip. Uh, but uh, so radar gives you this, and then, of course, we model the thing to try to get its shape, but we're really not going to know its shape until we get there exactly. We know it's about 500 meters across. Uh, we know its spin. We know its orbit pretty well. Um, why Bennu? Um, well, as I said before, there's over a million asteroids in the asteroid belt, but not all of those, most of them aren't accessible. Uh, we need the near-Earth objects, the ones that have orbits similar to the Earth. Um, there are, were 192 uh, uh, asteroids with optimal orbits for this mission, 26 with diameters uh, larger than 200 meters. That's important because if it's 200 meters or smaller, they tend to spin rapidly and they can eject stuff which is unacceptable. That's, it's hazardous. We don't want to uh, have our spacecraft be in danger. Um, five of those are carbonaceous, so carbon-rich meteorites. Those are the ones we're, we're trying to go after here. And then we chose Bennu from there. And I'll just point out, this is a potentially hazardous asteroid, not, not to scare anybody, but in the late 22 sec 22nd century, so I'll be gone. So that's way off in the future. Most of us won't be here. But there's a 1 in 2,500 uh, probability that this could impact Earth. And just to remind you, Chelyabinsk was 20 meters, did a lot of damages, 500 meters. You, you don't want this thing, <laughs> you don't want to be around if something like this hit the Earth. Next slide. Um, one of the things that um, is least understood about these orbits is they can be changed by what's called known as the Yarkovsky effect. So Ivan Yarkovsky discovered this in 1900, Russian um, engineer. And um, basically, you know, the sun heats up one side of these things and it gets hot. And then because they're spinning, um, you have a daytime and a, and a night side. And they re-radiate um, this heat in, in the form of infrared radiation, which also carries some momentum. So long story short, the sun actually can impart a small force on these objects. It's not a huge force for Bennu. It would be like holding three grapes in your hand. <laughs> That's the kind of force. So not much. But over millions of years, that little nudge can actually change the orbit quite a bit. Uh, and in Bennu's case, because it's a retrograde rotator, so it's going like this, it's actually spiraling in very slowly in towards the sun, um, its orbit changing as a result of this Yarkovsky effect. So we want to measure that, and we will measure that with OSIRIS-REx by looking at the spacecraft's position relative to the asteroid um, in greater precision than has ever been measured before. So hopefully we'll be better at predicting where this thing is going to be, and we can give a better probability than 1 in 2,500. We actually hopefully say it's 1 in you know, 10 million or something. Um, OK, next slide. Um, we actually have a lot of instruments on this spacecraft. Um, we've got uh, cameras uh, we can map. We've got a laser altimeter where we can get the slopes and the surface shape uh, very well. We've got infrared, uh, visible and infrared spectrometers where we can look for organic compounds, water and uh, uh, thermal um, emission spectrometer where we can look at the mineral composition. Um, bottom line, we want to use these instruments to find the best place to sample. Okay, it's a big, big asteroid, you know, 500 meters in, in diameter, and we want to bring back the best sample. So. Um, from my standpoint, you know, if we find a, a spot on there that's got a lot of organics, well, that would be a good thing to target. Um, but science isn't everything here. We have to make sure that it's safe to actually go there and do the touch and go procedure. We don't want to, you know, land on the side of a cliff, so it's got to be flat. There can't be a lot of rocks around. So safety is ultimately going to drive where we go, but science will play uh, a role as well. Next slide. And we're, when we decide on where we're going to go down, we're going to you do this maneuver called touch and go sampling. 
Um, so we're only going to spend five seconds on the surface in contact. Uh, we we want to get in there and get the heck out of there because you know we're controlling this is a ro robot remote controlling from very far away, <laughs> and um, you know bad things can happen um, as the Hayabusa Japanese mission realized. It's it's tricky to navigate around these things. Not a lot of gravity. So we're going to go down. We use this thing that's basically if you go to the next times that looks like a car air filter basically here. And what's going to happen is we're going to basically push nitrogen gas into the sample to fluidize it, get it moving around, and then we're going to trap it in this air filter. And then we're going to take that air filter and we're going to put it inside the sample return capsule and basically bring that back to Earth. So that's the plan. We go. Um, we've actually done something similar to this, not with an asteroid, but Stardust was a mission that flew through the comet tail. It's called the Stardust mission, built two, and brought back, um, and this is a, the sample return capsule that landed in Utah successfully. So we're trying to model that. We want to do the same thing. Huh? Yeah. Well, Genesis actually crashed. So there's, yeah, there's a whole story there. But um, the one that um, launched after this but came back first, collected the solar pond, unfortunately that, that just crashed. The parachute didn't open. But on this one, the parachute opened and everything went as planned. And hopefully that'll be the case with OREX. We'll bring them back. We'll have six months to characterize what we brought back course uh, in the laboratory in a clean environment. Uh, one of the things I want to emphasize is there's instrumentation that we use to study these meteorites. This is the ALS synch synchrotron beamline to look at organics. This instrument is a, the size of a, a facility, a huge building, and you just can't bring that kind of instrumentation to the asteroid to make the measurements each you. So again, this is one of the reasons why we want to bring this material back. And the stuff, we're going to archive most of it. It's going to be available for decades. So some of you kids who are still awake here watching this might be analyzing this stuff, you know, three decades from now, using instruments that we had never even dreamed of. Next slide. Okay, so that's it. Talk long enough. Um, if you want to learn more about ANSMET or if you want to apply to the program even, um, they accept applications. And there's some websites here. And then, yeah, OSIRISREx, uh, asteroidmission.org if you want to learn more about that mission as well. So thanks for your attention. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and, I, and I've taken that tour, um, and it's great that, that you can even, I think they still have a Martian meteorite that you can hold um, there as well, uh, but I, I, I don't know um, the date. Any other questions? Yep. Um, are you concerned that um, this last mission would bring back some form of life, some form of prominence brain? You know, you, you get that a lot, and um, I, I laugh because, you know, we've analyzed so many different types of these carbonaceous meteorites, and there's, you know, never found anything that, you know, DNA or a virus or anything like that. Um, we found, you know, simpler components of DNA, like I mentioned, the nucleobase, but nothing that we would consider life or, or harmful. But, you know, this actually gets more serious when you talk about Mars, you know, places where there, there really could have been life. NASA is planning a Mars sample return. And their planetary protection is actually, you know, it's no joking matter. If you go to Mars and you bring a sample back, you've got to make sure it's, it's sealed and that, you know, can guaranteed survive an impact and all that kind of stuff because you just don't know, you know. Um, most scientists think that, you know, asteroids and comets are probably not the place that you're going to find life itself. But places like Mars could be a different ballgame. So it's a good question.